Peter's message tonight comes from Joel chapter 2, and that's on page 644 in the Church Bible. We'll now read Joel chapter 2 from verses 1 to 17. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, like dawn spreading across the mountains, a large and mighty army comes, such as never was in ancient times, nor ever will be in ages to come. <clears throat> Before them fire devours, Behind them a flame blazes. Before them the land is like the Garden of Eden. Behind them a desert waste. Nothing escapes them. They have the appearance of horses. They gallop along like cavalry. With a noise like that of chariots, they leap over the mountaintops. Like a crackling fire consuming stubble, like a mighty army drawn up for battle. At the sight of them, nations are in anguish. Every face turns pale. They charge like warriors. They scale walls like soldiers. They all march in line, not swerving from their course. They do not jostle each other. Each marches straight ahead. They plunge through defences without breaking ranks. They rush upon the city. They run along the wall. They climb into the houses like thieves. They enter through the windows. Before them, the earth shakes. The heavens tremble. The sun and moon are darkened and the stars no longer shine. The Lord thunders at the head of his army. His forces are beyond number. And mighty is the army that obeys his command. The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. Who can endure it? Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Render your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity who knows, he may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing. Grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the assembly. Bring together the elders. Gather the children those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Amen. And May the Lord, may Lord bless this word to us as uh, Peter brings the message. Good evening. Well, we've seen from Joel that he's, uh, he's a preacher with two sermons. And in this very short little book, we have recorded both his sermons, the sermon about the locust plague and the sermon about the day of the Lord. And last time we had the locust plague, so tonight it's the day of the Lord. And, and, and what he's done, he's quite, quite clever really, he's quite the, the orator. He's, he's, he's talked about the locust plague as a forerunner of the day of the Lord, and he talks about the day of the Lord as being like a locust plague. So he proclaims, as we saw in the first sermon, the locust plague and the Lord's response to it. Now in the second sermon, 
he talks about the day of the Lord and how the Lord responds to the prophecy of that coming day. So uh, if I keep my Bible open at Joel and you keep your Bible open at Joel, we'll, uh, we'll be on speaking terms tonight. And we'll let Joel minister his sermon to us. So this is, a, this is the day of the Lord. And blow the trumpet in Zion. This is how he begins his sermon. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand. So you know at this point he's not talking about the locust plague. The locust plague was in the past. The day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand. And at verse 11, the end of verse 11, the day of the Lord is great, it is dreadful, who can endure it? So the blowing the trumpet is like sounding a warning. They would blow the trumpet, they would blow the ram's horn. When armies were advancing on Israel, they would blow the trumpet to warn people. It's like a call to arms, a call to prepare, a call to mount the battlements, a call to take up your weapons, a, a call to be on the defensive. The enemy was coming, and, and here he, he's using that same idea, blow the trumpet, sound the alarm, because the day of the Lord is coming. Be prepared for it. Be armed for it. Be expecting it. And uh, in uh, chapter 3 of Joel, we have an extended uh, comment by God on the day of the Lord. So we're going to skim and dip our way through the book of Joel and we'll finish with Joel tonight and leave his sermon ringing in our ears. Well, what is this day of the Lord that Joel is talking about? Well, the day of the Lord is an expression that is spoken of throughout Scripture. Throughout the Bible, you'll find this expression surfacing the day of the Lord. It's, a, it's something that was anticipated by the Old Testament prophets and it was fulfilled in the coming of Jesus Christ, and it is spoken of extensively in the book of Revelation. The day of the Lord is a day that comes with Jesus. And because it comes with Jesus, it comes in two installments, or if you like, it comes in two stages, corresponding to Christ's first coming and his second coming. So what is it? What is the day of the Lord? Well, it's a day when God's kingdom will be fully realized and manifest on earth. Secondly, it will be a day in which God will deal finally and forever with his enemies by way of a final judgment. Thirdly, it's a day when God's people will be delivered for more persecution, suffering and sin. Fifthly, it will be a day when there will be a new heavens and a new earth. And it will be a day that it will be signaled by cosmic signs and calamities when the stars begin to fall. All of that is, is, uh, is what the day of the Lord is about. All of that occurs on the day of the Lord. And you see in Joel chapter 2 and what we've read, and in Joel chapter 3, he is anticipating the day of the Lord exactly in those terms. It will be a great day of deliverance for God's people. Nothing less than the completion of their salvation, which Jesus died to accomplish. And you remember that when Jesus came on that first stage, it was accompanied by cosmic signs. Cosmic signs, angels in the heavens, the darkness at the cross, a supernatural darkness. These were cosmic signs. These were day of the Lord signs. Because Jesus is the king, and when Jesus the king came, he brought his kingdom with him and won a great victory over Satan and over sin. You see, this is part of what the day of the Lord entails, and it was there, accompanied by cosmic signs and wonders. That was just the first stage. The second stage of completion of the day of the Lord will be when Jesus comes back and there will be a comp comprehensive culmination and fulfillment of all that the day of the Lord promises and the final judgment against his enemies. Why is it called the day of the Lord? Well, it's called the day of the Lord because it's the Lord's day. It's his day. It's the day in which he shows himself, a day in which he manifests himself. 
It's a day that belongs completely to him and to his victories. It really is his day. Now we meet, we meet for worship on the first day of the week. And in the New Testament, the day we meet for worship, this day is called the Lord's Day. It's called the Lord's Day because it's a day that belongs completely to him and to his victory over sin, and we gather together to celebrate exactly that. So here on this day, on the Lord's Day, we anticipate the day of the Lord. We anticipate in our weekly Lord's Day service, we anticipate the fulfillment of the coming day of the Lord. So returning now to Joel chapter 2. Sound the alarm. The day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand. Verse 2. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and blackness like dawn spreading across the mountains. A large and mighty army comes such was never of old nor will ever be in the ages to come. And this mighty army here is not the locust plague. This mighty army is nothing less than the armies of heaven coming on the Lord's day to achieve a great victory. It's a day that's accompanied by cosmic signs and wonders, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Verse 10 of chapter 2. Before them the earth shakes and the sky trembles, the sun and the moon are darkened and the stars no longer shine. The Lord thunders at the head of his army. His forces are beyond number, and mighty are those who obey his command. The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. Who can endure it? It's a day when God himself comes with the heavenly army in judgment against all mankind, including Israel. So what is the preacher's application? As he preaches this message of the day of the Lord, what is Joel's application? Well, it's there in verse 12 of chapter 2. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. This should be our response as we anticipate the day of the Lord coming. It should be a rendering of our hearts, it says in verse 13. Rend your hearts and return to the Lord, for he is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Turn to the Lord with all your heart. You see, it's not just a matter of acknowledging in our minds, hmm, yes, this day of the Lord, it's all very interesting, and yes, I believe it is coming. And uh, yes, it's all rather ho-hum, because it's not here yet. And, and uh, uh, Joel says, no, that's not the right response. You need a response of the heart, where the heart is rent. Now, you'll appreciate that it was ancient Jewish custom that in a time of mourning and grief and loss, they would tear their clothes, and uh, particularly at a funeral. And here, Joel is picking up on that and saying, it's time to tear your heart, to rend your heart, to break your heart open so that your sin can be dealt with because God is a compassionate God and full of mercy. And, and so he can deal with your sin now before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. Those who so turn to God with rendered hearts will find him gracious, compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love there in verse 13. And, and you see, here's the, here's the glorious picture we have of God on that day of the Lord. When, when the day of the Lord comes and the Lord would, comes in his mighty army of judgment and victory and war, he comes to us who have rendered hearts. He comes to us as the verse 14, as the verse 13 God. He comes as a divine warrior who is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in love. This is the picture we have of God who comes to us on that awful day. That, that's how he is, he is to us. This is how he will be on the day to those who have heeded the call to rend their hearts. So there's two sides, you see, to the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment and anger. The day of the Lord is also a day of love, graciousness, and compassion. We have a God here who does not delight in the death of the wicked, but who pauses in his way to urge a return to his love with rendered hearts. What does that mean to have a rendered heart? Well, it means that we must allow ourselves to be troubled by our sin. 
We must allow ourselves to be troubled by our sin to the point where we can name our sin. And we can name the people and occasions in which our sin has been manifested. That's what it means to rend our hearts. It's to break our heart open so our sin is now exposed and able to be seen and able to be named. Then we have something concrete to bring before the Lord rather than just, Father, forgive my sins. It's, Lord, forgive me because yesterday at 3 p.m., I said such and such to so and so, and that wasn't a good thing to say. It was a sinful thing to say. It was a hurtful thing to say, Lord, forgive me. And, and we do that in the light of, of Joel 2.13. We say that to a God that is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. <laughs> so with confidence, you see, we rend our hearts before him. In other words, we must be more troubled by our own sin then we are troubled about the sins of others. Whose sins do we find ourselves being most concerned about? The sins of others or our own? We can't rend their hearts for them. We can only rend our own hearts. So Joel summons the nation. You see there in verse 15, Blow the trumpet in Zion and declare a holy fast and call a sacred assembly and gather the people. Bring together the elders and gather the children. Everyone must come. Everyone must be there. The whole community must come together and cry out to the Lord for his salvation. And so we come together with a frank and sober awareness that our sin is real and that God is real. And that in his love and compassion he will forgive the rendered heart. Now from chapter 2 verse 28 to the end of Joel, we have more teaching on the day of the Lord. And in chapter 3, verse 12, for instance, we have another summons. In chapter 2, we had a summons to the nation of Israel to gather together before the Lord. In chapter 3, verse 12, we have another summons. This time it's a summons to the nations of the world. Let the nations be aroused. Let them advance into the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the nations on every side. This is the day of the Lord's judgment on the nations of the world. And there God will pour out his judgment on his enemies. But on his people who have rendered their hearts, he will pour out something else. Rather than pouring out his judgments on his people, he will pour out his Holy Spirit. And you see that in chapter 2, verse 28. And afterward I will pour out my spirit on all your people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. And the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. You see those cosmic signs? Those cosmic signs that speak of that day of the Lord when, when uh, we'll have the culmination of the kingdom of God and the appearance of Jesus Christ. And there in verse 30, 32, And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. And this is why, you see, in chapter 2, in verse 15, when he summons the nation, he says in chapter 2, 16, Gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring the elders, gather the children. Why does he say bring the children? Why does he say bring the children? Why does he say bring the young people? Because in verse 28, your sons and daughters will have the Holy Spirit poured out upon them on that day. Gather the young ones, gather the old ones, because the Spirit of God will be poured out on every one of them. Every one of them who gathered, gather with a rendered heart. Here you see the two installments of the day of the Lord. The installment when the Spirit is poured out and the second installment when the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes in two stages. In the first coming of Jesus, the Spirit was poured out generally and liberally on all his people. No one was left out, young and old, male and female, rich and poor. Everyone, we're told in verse 32, who calls on the name of the Lord will have that wonderful pouring out of the Spirit upon them. 
And those in verse 32, those who call on the name of the Lord at the end of the verse will be those whom the Lord calls. You see that? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord and at the end of the verse, whom the Lord calls. Those who call on the name of the Lord will be the ones that the Lord has called and he has called them together. He has summoned them together. He has gathered them together so he can pour out his spirit upon them. That's why everyone must be present. Everyone must respond to that call, young and old. Well, we know when that happened, don't we, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and Peter's great sermon. He, he quotes exactly these verses from the book of Joel, thus showing that this aspect of the day of the Lord was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 2, verse 14, then Peter stood up with the eleven and raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And there were some cosmic signs, weren't there? There was the unnatural darkness that fell on the crucified Christ. But from his cross, on that first stage of the day of the Lord, fulfillment from that cross, the message of whoever went out in the preaching of the gospel, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We see the universal and free offer of the gospel right here in Joel's prophecy being fulfilled in the preaching of Peter on the day of Pentecost, that the the clarion cause goes out. The day of the Lord is coming. You've had the first installment. Jesus Christ has died. Jesus Christ has won a great victory. You've seen the Holy Spirit poured out liberally on all. The day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord is here. The day of the Lord has come. The day of the Lord is coming. Therefore, the message goes out. Call on the name of the Lord that you might be saved. Just as Joel has prophesied, it would be a great and glorious day of the Lord's coming. Yet the judgment of the nations has been delayed until the second coming of Jesus, that second installment. So the day of the Lord has come, but not yet in its fullness. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. His life, his ministry, and his death ushered in the day of the Lord, the coming of the kingdom of God in power. Jesus Christ is the lamb that was slain for our redemption, but in his resurrection and his, in his ascension and in his return, he is the divine warrior who comes to do battle with the forces of evil. The day of the Lord is nothing less than the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is his day from start to finish, and on that day the Lord will summon the nations to answer him, and they will come and do battle. Chapter 3, verse 9. Proclaim this among the nations, prepare for war, rouse the warriors, let all the fighting men draw near and attack. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weakling say, I am strong. Come quickly, all you nations on every side, and assemble here. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. And so the nations come. The nations come to do battle on that day of the Lord. They come to assemble before the armies of heaven. And they find themselves, when they do that, in the presence of the judge of all the earth. Verse 12, let the nations be roused. Let them advance into the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the nations on every side. The nations come to do battle with God, only to find that God is there to pass judgment upon them. See in verse 15, here's the cosmic signs. The sun and the moon will be darkened and the stars no longer shine. The Lord, the Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the sky will tremble, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people. So Joel's prophecy was fulfilled in its first installment with the coming of Jesus 
as we saw in Acts chapter 2. But the final fulfillment and installment is yet to come in the second coming of Jesus, as we see in the book of Revelation chapter 14. And in, the, in Revelation chapter 14, John picks up on this language from Joel chapter 3 to show us that the fulfillment is in Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 14, verse 14. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like the Son of Man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, Take, take your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of grapes from the earth's vine, because the grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth and gathered its grapes and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city. The blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horses' bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. That's a picture of the Lord's judgment on the nations. You see, there is no great battle on that final day of the Lord. The nations come to do battle, and instead God in his judgment just wipes them away in his wrath. God's Spirit has been poured out. That's why the assembly of the church must include all those who have called on the name of the Lord. None of the brothers and sisters must be excluded. The young people must be here and present. They also have received the Holy Spirit. They also have a contribution to make as they tell us of their experiences of Christ. There must be testimonies given here before us and among us. From every age among us, there is not one who has missed out on that glorious fulfillment of the Holy Spirit coming upon young and old. Because those who call on the name of the Lord are those whom the Lord has called. They all have a blessing to share of God's goodness and of God's graciousness. What was promised to the nation of Israel has now been fulfilled in us according to the Spirit. Finally, as it says in Romans chapter 9, verse 8. <coughs> Romans chapter 9, verse 8. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. So Joel's promise and prophecy of the day of the Lord comes to us, the spiritual offspring of Abraham. We are the ones in whom the day of the Lord is fulfilled. Our very presence here in this building tonight testifies that the day of the Lord prophecies are being fulfilled in our midst. The Holy Spirit has been poured out. Who are those who will stand on that day? Those who have called on the name of the Lord for the forgiveness of their sins. Young and old, male and female, rich and poor, every ethnicity, language, tribe, tongue, nation or clan. Let us come together and together exalt the Lord, for great is his mercy and great is his victory in our hearts and in our lives and in our congregation. The day of the Lord has come. The day of the Lord is coming. God is faithful to his promises. He will not leave his people without a fulfillment and all that he has promised. Amen.